It's time for your Low Country Real Estate Market Update. It's the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. Brian is one of the top 1% real estate agents in Charleston. Find him online at listingsincharleston.com. That's listingsincharleston.com. Or call him at 843-345-1273. Now, broadcasting from the WTMA studios, here's your host, Brian Beatty. Good morning, Charleston. You're listening to the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on the Big Talker 1250 WTMA. Thanks for joining me this morning. I'm your host, Brian Beatty. And for those of you that have uh, just tuned into this program for the first time, let me give you an idea of what this show is about. It's very simple. We talk about all things residential real estate here on this program. I like to take national, regional, local news, apply that to us here in the low country. So if you're thinking about buying, selling, or investing in real estate, you have an idea of what's going on in our market. And you've got some good, solid information that you can hang your hat on so that you can make informed decisions when it comes to real estate. And again, you might be considering buying, selling, or investing, or you just might be the type of person that finds real estate fascinating like me, and you'd like to stay informed on what's going on in our market, and you use this program as an opportunity to just increase your overall knowledge in our industry. So that's what this show is all about. And uh, for those of you, again, that are tuning in for the first time, My name is Brian Beatty. I've been one of the top 1% real estate agents in our market for the past several years in a row. And uh, I also rely on my experience as somebody that's day-to-day in this market to help you understand what's going on, to give you a realistic idea of what our market is all about. So if there's anything that I can do to help you, you're considering buying, selling, or investing in real estate, or you know somebody that might be considering uh, one of those moves, I invite you to give me a call personally. My cell phone number is 843 345 one two seven three. Again, that's eight four three three four five twelve seventy three. Or go to my website, listingsincharleston.com. And on that website you can take a look at everything I have for sale, everything I've sold. You can read testimonials from past clients. Of course you can search the MLS. Every property for sale in the Tri County area is available on my website. And if you're thinking about selling your house, click on the sell your home tab. You can learn more about what I do to market my properties for sale the success I've had in doing so. And you can also learn more about my 59-day home sale guarantee, which very simply states, I will sell your home in 59 days or less, or I'll sell it for half my commission. So listingsincharleston.com is the website to go to for that. Let me give you an idea of what I want to talk about over the next hour. You know, uh, there's the saying in real estate that there's never a dull day in real estate. And I find that to be true. I've been doing this program for close to three years now. And I always have fresh content because there's always something new to talk about. Uh, again, I rely on my experiences as somebody that, you know, already this year we've, we've done almost 90 transactions. We're halfway through the year. We've got a goal of 200 homes sold this year. And um, we've had some interesting interactions with clients, uh, both that we represent and on the other side of the table and with real estate agents. And so what I want to talk about this morning, first and foremost, are HOAs. It's really important that people have an understanding of what HOAs are, what they were designed to do, and how they can impact you if you decide to buy a home or a condo or a townhouse in an area governed by an HOA. So I've put together some information for you to take into consideration. A little after that, we're going to talk about negotiating in this market. I've come up with 10 things that you should never say to a buyer or to an agent that represents the buyer. All of this is done to protect you, the consumer, you, the client, so that when you're going to sell your home, you don't accidentally put your foot in your mouth. Or your agent doesn't put their foot in their own mouth, and then they have to backtrack because they've put you in a compromised situation. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, We're also going to talk about um, timing the process of selling your home and then buying another. It's very important that you get that timing right. Obviously, people have a fear of being homeless. They sell their house and then something happens with the home they're trying to buy and they have nowhere to go. So I want to talk about that and really give people a good understanding of of how that process works. And then lastly, we're going to talk about considering cash offers on your house in this market and why it might not be the best idea to jump immediately on a cash offer. I'm going to give you some things to think about with regard to that. So again, this is the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. If you have any questions for me, Call me, 843-345-1273. We'll discuss anything you'd like. No cost, no obligation. Just here to help in any way I can. Or go to my website, listingsincharleston.com. So let's talk about HOAs. For some, uh, you know, there really is a love or hate relationship when it comes to HOAs. And and, and some people see them as being 
The root of all evil, some people will only live in areas governed by an HOA because they have an expectation of how people should live in their home. So what are HOA? You know, the HOAs were designed very simply to maintain the quality of life for the community's residents and to protect property values for all owners. Okay? And think about it. Because multiple people might live in the same building or subdivision, all residents are equally responsible for maintaining the common areas uh, of the buildings, such as landscaping, elevators, swimming pools, tennis courts, clubhouses, you know, parking garages, security gates, roofing, building exterior, windows, all of that good stuff. So the first thing that I always tell people that are considering buying a home in an HOA is you really have to look inside and you have to consider your own temperament. What kind of person are you? Are you the type of person that hates being told what to do? Are you the type of person that doesn't like having to operate under a set of rules imposed by others? If that's the case, then living in a community with very strict HOA rules is going to be a very frustrating experience for you. So you need to understand first how you want to live your life in your home and in your community. Again, one of the, you know, one of the major benefits of home ownership and one of the things that people get really excited about is the ability to customize or alter your property to suit your needs. But again, if HOA rules um, interfere with this, then that's really going to be a frustrating process for you. So it's incredibly, un- it's incredibly important that you have an understanding of the HOA rules. Now, these rules are called covenants, conditions, and restrictions, CCNR. Okay? And essentially what they do is they outline what you can and cannot do with your property, the process associated with um, imposing fines, if you break those rules, those covenants, conditions, and restrictions, and again, how that impacts you. So you need to pay particular attention, in my opinion, to the, to the rules associated with, with the fines that are imposed by the HOA. You might live in a neighborhood where if you don't get your trash can out from the front of the street uh, <laughs> the day that the trash is taken out, you're going to get a fine. And those fines can be 50 bucks, 100 bucks a pop. I don't know about you, but I have no interest in paying $100 to an HOA because I forgot to get my trash can at the end of my street that day. Although I get plenty of flack from my wife about it, so I've got that as a constant reminder. Um, But you really have to have an understanding of what these covenants, conditions, and restrictions stand for. I'll give you an example. Because some of these HOAs have restrictions on the number of guests that you can have in uh, common areas. So we sold a condo to a first-time home buyer. Single guy, bought his first place. Um, We read through the covenants and restrictions. I actually have my clients sign something that says they have reviewed it. They have an understanding of it. They know what they're getting themselves into. Well, he bought this condo. He's very excited about it. He had a very large family. So he invited his brothers and sisters, his mom, his dad, and a few friends out to have a pool party to celebrate the purchase of his first home. Well, guess what? He could only have two guests meaning he could not have that pool party, that welcoming pool party that he was so excited about, that his family was so excited about, because some lifeguard at the pool said, sorry, you can only have two guests per person, per resident. Couldn't even have a pool party. Something like that, as simple as that may sound, really can ruin the way in which you enjoy the property that you've purchased. Other people uh, might not take things into consideration like parking on the street or having a boat in your driveway. Or there's this laundry list of things that you really need to take into consideration when buying these properties. And I'll tell you, if you haven't read through a set of covenants and restrictions before, it can at times be shocking. The the things that they have in there that uh, might be blindsiding for you and it might potentially kill your deal. So it's incredibly important before you buy a home in an HOA that you have an understanding of what's going on in there. Okay. Something else to take into consideration is do your homework. Make sure that the house you're buying isn't already out of compliance with the HOA. We took a look at a house a little earlier in the year, and uh, I know the I know the neighborhood very well. Sold multiple homes in the neighborhood, and I looked at the fence in the backyard, and I just kind of said to myself, and then I said out loud, you know, I, I I wonder whether that fence was approved or not. So we did some digging. We found out that that fence was out of compliance. The guy ripped out a fence that was in compliance, installed his own, and now 
He's left with a property that he needs to sell because he's strapped for cash, and he doesn't have the ability to install the fence that he threw away that was in compliance. So he's essentially selling a house with a six-foot privacy fence in a neighborhood that doesn't allow it, and that can't be taken into consideration when valuing his property. Because if I'm going to list a house and it has the fence backyard, I give credit to the seller for that. That's added value to the property that I'm selling. So it's incredibly important that you have an understanding of whether or not the house that you're buying is in compliance or not with HOA rules and regulations. And the last thing that I'll say about HOAs is that you have to have a very clear understanding of the fees associated with that HOA. How much are they? Do you pay them monthly? Do you pay them quarterly? Do you pay them annually? And more importantly, especially if you're buying in a condo or a townhouse, have there been special assessments? A special assessment is very simple. If they don't have enough money in their reserve account to cover unforeseen expenses, guess who gets billed for it? You, the homeowner. Classic example are all of these condo communities on James Island and West Ashley and Mount Pleasant and other areas of Charleston where they ended up suing the builder or developer for faulty construction. They won their case or they got a settlement from their case but the amount of money that they received out of that lawsuit wasn't enough money to cover all of the repairs necessary. Well, guess who has to foot the bill? The owners. So if you're thinking about buying a property that's a condo or a townhouse, you have to have a, and, and a house too, because there are, there are ways in which a special assessment can apply to those that live in a neighborhood of single family homes. You have to have a very clear understanding of how much is in the reserve account. Is that HOA healthy? Can they weather unforeseen expenses? Have they had special assessments in the past few years? Ask for a copy of it. Ask for a copy of the HOA minutes. And make sure, if you're going to buy a home in an HOA, that the rules imposed on the owners that live in that property fit with your expectations and how you want to live in your home. So I've put together a list of about 25 things to watch out for if you're going to buy a home in an HOA. And all you need to do to get that list is go to my website, listingsincharleston.com, and go to the contact page, request a copy of it, say, Brian, send me your HOA notes, and I'll email that right over to you. Okay, Listingsincharleston.com is the website for that. Or you can give me a call, 843-345-1273. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the 10 things you should never say to a buyer if you want to maintain your position of, of strong negotiability when you're buying or selling a house. So stick around. This is the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. I'll be right back. Hear the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show every Saturday morning at 8 on 1250 WTMA and WTMA.com. WTMA. You're listening to the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show on the Big Talker, 1250 WTMA and WTMA.com. Welcome back, Charleston. You're listening to the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on the Big Talker 1250 WTMA. Thanks again for tuning in. We really appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about us, our story, uh, what we do to sell real estate, how we interact with other agents, buyers, and sellers, and how we dissect that information so that at what comes time for you to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, you're an informed consumer. You've taken that information, you've applied it to your own personal situation, and you're better for it. So if there's anything that I can do for you, you thinking about buying, selling, or investing in real estate, I invite you to give me a call personally. My number is 843-345-1273. Again, that's 843-345-1273. Or you can go to my website, listingsincharleston.com. And on that website, you can look at everything for sale, everything I've sold, learn a little bit more about me. And if you're thinking about selling your house, again, click on the Sell Your Home tab. You can learn more about my marketing. And you can learn more about my 59-day home sale guarantee, which very simply states I will sell your home in 59 days or less, or I'll sell it for half my commission. So listingsincharleston.com is the website to go to for that. And if you're just tuning in, we were just talking about HOAs and the impact that that can have on the way in which you live in your property. And I've put together a list of 25 things to watch out for. So again, if you go to that website, listingsincharleston.com, you can get a copy of that list so that, again, you're an informed consumer. There are a lot of things on there that you might not have thought about prior to seeing that list. So it's important that you cross your T's and you dot your I's and you make sure that you have all of your questions answered before you buy a home in an HOA. 
So let's move on. Let's talk about the 10 things that you should never say to a buyer. So this is really from the standpoint of a seller. So think about this, all right? You're a seller. You've got your home on the market. You know the drill. The doorbell rings. You've plumped your cushions. You take one last look at the house, make sure everything is in order. You open the door. You let the buyers in. You say hi. They say hi. And then boom, there's an interaction where they start asking you some questions. And even though you might not have anticipated talking to that buyer, here you are, you're having a conversation with the buyer. And I always coach my clients and I don't want you to take this personally, but I don't want you to talk to the buyer. I don't want you to talk to the buyer agent. Why? Because they are listening with open ears for anything they can find out about you, about your home, about the area to use against you in negotiations. I do it when I represent buyers, and it's reasonable to assume that other agents are doing the same thing. So just don't talk to them. But here are some of the things that you can say that might have an impact on your ability to sell your home. So number one would be, well, we don't really want to move, but fill in the blank. My husband or wife died, or we've just outgrown the house, or we're getting divorced. Well, obviously, these are all genuine reasons for selling a home but they're pretty much guaranteed to turn the majority of buyers off. The the overwhelming majority of buyers have a phobia of buying a house where someone has died in it. So obviously don't say that. That should be, uh, you know, pretty simple. I would hope that people don't say that. Obviously as agents, we have to disclose that information if we're asked, but certainly don't volunteer that information. You know, as to the size issue, a buyer might think that your home is plenty big enough until you point out just how small it is for you. And saying something like, well, we're getting divorced, obviously they have an emotional connection to the house. They don't want to feel like they're moving into a house where something like that has happened. As silly as that might sound, again, our job is to create an emotional connection between the buyer and the house because emotion is what makes people act. Logic is what makes people think. So your throwaway comment might inadvertently push them toward a bigger, more expensive house or just not your house in general. So it's important that you don't say those types of things. Number two, and you might not have thought about this, but, oh, you'll love this neighborhood. It's so perfect for fill in the blank. It's child-friendly. It's sociable. It's quiet. Whatever the case might be, you are in dangerous territory talking about your neighborhood because unless you know exactly what that buyer wants, and obviously chances are you don't, you might be selling the exact opposite reason of what that buyer's looking for. But sellers do this all the time. They sell the neighborhood, but you might be selling the wrong aspects of that neighborhood. You never know. And, and don't take the buyer's physical appearance or their family makeup for granted as an understanding of, of what they're looking for. A family might have two kids, but they hate the idea of you know street hockey outside their house or a bunch of kids knocking on their door or a bunch of activity, they might want to live a very quiet, sequestered life. You just never know. So it's better not to say anything at all. Number three, you're our fill-in-the-blank showing. You're our first showing. You're our 10th showing. You're our 100th showing. Whatever number you insert, discussing how many showings you've had leaves your situation open to all sorts of interpretations. Okay? Too few showings, and the buyers might think, well, maybe no one's coming through the door because it's overpriced. Too many showings and people are automatically to think, wow, they've had that many showings, but they haven't sold it. I wonder what's wrong with the house. Don't discuss how many showings you have. It's open to interpretation and they're going to take it the wrong way. You might think that you're saying something like, well, hey, you're our first showing. But again, they might use that information against you. Number four would be something simple like, oh, well, I'm sorry. You know, I've been meaning to clean that for ages, but fill in the blank. Look, nothing turns a buyer off faster than a filthy house. I understand that people live in their homes. They have busy lives. They've got stuff going on, especially if you have kids and you're working. Look, there's a lot to do to prepare a house for sale. It's a stressful process. It's not easy. Nobody said it was going to be. But when you show your home, you have to make sure it's clean. And I know that that, it just has to be. And I know that can sound harsh at times given what you've got going on in your life. But the last thing you want is for the buyer to be focused on your clutter rather than the house itself. Number five, oh, you should try the local fill-in-the-blank. It's really great. Church, school, Starbucks, whatever it is, just don't say it all. Your buyer might be of different faith or no faith at all. They might think that, uh, 
large coffee conglomerates are the root of all evil. You just never know. It's, it's, it's just giving the buyer another reason to apply their own particular situation to your house. And if you're giving them information to the contrary, not, might, might not be within your best interest to make that comment. Number six, the roofing is new or the windows are new or the siding is new. Well, new is a relative term. To me, new would be something installed over the last six months. But all the time I sit down with sellers and they say, well, yeah, our our roof is new and our HVAC system is new. Okay, when was it installed? 2011. Well, I understand that it's newer, but it's not new. And we have to be very careful about how we position those big ticket items to particular buyers. Some people might feel like, oh, well, they're trying to they're trying to dupe me a little bit here. They say that they have new windows, but they were installed five years ago. Just don't say any of that at all. Have a very straightforward approach as to when they were installed and then leave it be. Number seven, well, you can't have everything. And look, you're probably right. Buyers probably can't have everything, especially in a seller's market. But most home buyers have to make a choice between a master suite or a large yard or a double car garage or a more affluent neighborhood or whatever the case might be because it's all dictated by their budget and what they want in that house. But it's it's not your job to tell the buyer what they should expect or where they should compromise. And again, anything that you say can be held against you. So it's just important not to say those things at all. Number eight would be, oh, well, we're a bit short on fill in the blank storage or kitchen space, or yard space, whatever the case might be. Look, I understand the, the need to be honest, and I think that that's uh, an admirable approach. But if you were to tell somebody that you're short on storage, and they're the type of person that has a lot of stuff, and you point that out to them as, as something that might be your own issue, maybe you just, you're a pack rat. Maybe you just have too much stuff, and you've been waiting to declutter for years, as, as a lot of us have, quite frankly. But pointing out that the house doesn't have enough storage or it doesn't have enough countertop space, and that's why you're selling, is going to immediately put their focus on those issues, and it's going to take away from what might have excited them about your house in the beginning. Maybe they're moving from a house where the kitchen is, is from the 1970s, and it's just a piece of you-know-what, and, and they want a new kitchen. So they don't care if they have less, less countertop space. Maybe your cabinetry is newer, and you've got granite countertops and stainless steel appliances, and that's exactly what they're looking for. But then you point out how small it is and they say, gosh, well, you know what? It's a really nice kitchen, but they're right. Yeah, it is kind of small. Don't put yourself in that position. Number nine, this is incredibly important. Well, we've bought another home or we're under contract with another house. As soon as you say that, the buyer understands that you are in a potentially precarious situation in that now they've understood why you're selling your home. They've identified the need to sell the home. And they're going to use that against you. I know I certainly would if I'm a buyer agent. And it's incredibly important that you don't say that specific sentence because they're going to look at you and say, hmm, maybe they're desperate. It's going to justify in their mind offering you less for your house because they understand your situation. And then lastly, number 10, and this is kind of a a classic question that I ask for sale by owners. And you'd be surprised at how many for sale by owners answer me honestly. And I say, you know, I understand you're asking $400,000 for your house, but if I were to bring you a cash offer of say three seventy five, dollars is that something you consider? They'll say, yeah, well, I'm sure we can negotiate some on the price and, and come to a, an understanding. Don't comment on price at all ever. It's really important that you don't. You don't want to give that buyer the preconceived notion that they can get a good deal on your house. All we need to do is present your home in a professional way We expose the areas of your home that we feel are of value and that are going to be of value to buyers. And then we let them make the decision. We answer their questions. We handle their objections. We identify the things that are important to the buyer. And we essentially flip the script. Rather than them asking us why we're selling, let's ask them why they're buying. What's important to you about this house? You know, one of the questions that I ask buyers when they call on my yard signs is what was it about that house that was of interest to you? They tell me, And then boom, I understand what they're looking for. And if I'm a listing agent, I represent the seller. Guess what the rest of the conversation is going to be steered toward? Why they called on that house in the first place. I'm going to identify in that house or in that area how it will fit well with their goals and their needs. And it's all just a matter of converting that lead into a potential sale. 
So those are some things that you should never say if you're a seller. And obviously these are things that can't and shouldn't be said by a listing agent, but they're said all the time. Our job as a listing agent is to maintain your confidentiality and not compromise your position. This is a poker game. We are not here to show your cards for the sake of making a commission and moving on to the next deal. And I think that's a legitimate concern for sellers. And I think it should be because there are a lot of agents out there that will answer these questions or that will say these things and they automatically have a negative impact on your home. So stick around because we've got more to talk about. And if you're a seller, even though we're in a great seller's market right now, I'm going to, I'm going to give some ideas for you on why it might not be within your best interest to take that immediate cash offer. So we're going to talk about all that and more as the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show continues. Again, feel free to reach out to me personally, 843-345-1273. Maybe you're considering selling your house. Uh, Or you can go to my website, listingsincharleston.com. Click on the Sell Your Home tab. You can learn more about what I do to market my properties for sale. And you can learn more about my 59-day home sale guarantee. Listingsincharleston.com. This is the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. More stimulating talk on real estate matters with Brian Beatty next on 1250 WTMA. 1250 WTMA. Now, the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show continues on Charleston's Big Talker, 1250 WTMA. Welcome back, Charleston, and thanks again for tuning in to the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on the Big Talker, 1250 WTMA. This is the point in the program where I always like to say thank you for those of you that Tune in on a consistent basis. And for those of you that legitimately use this radio show as an opportunity to learn more about real estate, you know, I've been doing this for, for three years. I've been in the top of our market for uh, six going on seven years now. And it's my honor. It's my pleasure to share my experiences with you and help you grow as individuals with regard to your knowledge in real estate. I have always been the type of person that real estate is all I will ever do because I have an s- extreme passion for it. And I like educating people and I like setting realistic expectations based on what's going on in our market. And that's what this show is all about. So if there's anything that I can do for you, you're considering buying, selling, or investing, or you know somebody that I might be able to potentially help, I'd love the opportunity to earn your business. I can be reached on my cell phone at 843-345-1273, 843-345-1273. Call or text me. Or you can go to my website, listingsincharleston.com. And on that site, you can take a look at everything I have for sale, everything I've sold. You can search the MLS, learn more about me, and you can learn more about what I do to market my properties for sale by clicking on the Sell Your Home tab. And you can also learn more about my 59-day home sale guarantee, which is very simple. It just states that I will sell your home in 59 days or less, or I'll sell it for half my commission. So go online and request more information on that. And I'll send you an email, call, or text you, whatever you prefer. So let's switch gears here. And let's talk about selling properties a little bit more. I just told you 10 things that you should never say to a buyer that might compromise your position when it comes to selling your home. It compromises your confidentiality. It compromises your ability to get the best deal possible for your house. Let's talk now about cash offers and why it might not be the best idea for you to take that immediate cash offer. Well, if you look at the first quarter of this year, almost 40% of all closings came from cash buyers, which is very attractive from a seller standpoint. You know, for home sellers, it sounds like cash is the safe bet. Why? Because you don't have to worry about a buyer not being able to get financing. The number one reason why deals fall through is because a buyer wasn't able to get a mortgage. I would say that the number two reason is home inspections. and The number three reason is appraisals. When you're dealing with a cash buyer, you don't have to worry about the lending process. And in some cases, you don't have to worry about the appraisal justifying the contract amount because their lender doesn't require it. Doesn't require it. They, they don't exist. So let's talk first about the appeal of cash. Why is cash appealing? Well, again, you don't have to deal with a buyer getting financed. And the the really scary thing is for a seller and for a listing agent is although a buyer might submit a pre-qualification letter or a pre-approval letter from a lender, there is no guarantee 
that that financing will go through. It's my job as a listing agent in protecting my seller to do my due diligence. So I call the buyer's lender and I ask them some straightforward questions about the credit worthiness and the purchasing power of that particular buyer. Now that lender doesn't necessarily have to answer all of my questions, but I have the right contractually, it's actually in the agreement to buy and sell real estate that I have the ability to call and check on the credit worthiness of that buyer, which is why, in my opinion, it's incredibly important that you understand the difference between a pre-qualification, a pre-approval letter, and an approval letter. You know, I work with Movement Mortgage because I feel that they do a fantastic job in this process and that they will take a buyer through the underwriting process before they even identify a home so that when my buyer agents are working with buyers and we make an offer on something, let's say we're in a multiple offer situation, Well, if we're neck and neck with another buyer and they see that my buyer has been approved for financing, not pre-qualified, pre-qualifying just means they ran their credit and they asked them some questions about their income and their debt. An approval means that their underwriting department has already checked on all of those issues to determine whether or not they will get a mortgage. So if my lender says that they're approved, then that means they're approved. That is almost as good as a cash deal, but not quite. So obviously the appeal of cash from a seller standpoint is that you don't run the risk of having several weeks or months taken up by a buyer that might not be able to get financing because what's the last thing to always come up that kills a deal financing. And this is kind of getting very specific, but in our contracts in South Carolina, there is a sentence in there that says that the financing contingency expires at closing, meaning if the buyer can't get a mortgage, and it's a contingency to the contract, they have a right to get out of that contract and get their earnest money back. It's incredibly important that the seller and the agent that they hire have a firm understanding of that. So what's the catch with with cash offers? Why why am I saying uh, you might not want to consider a cash offer? What What I mean by that is you need to take that offer and you need to determine everything else in, in that offer and whether or not it's realistic and it's consistent with market trends. Why do most people make cash offers on property rather than getting financing in a time where interest rates are incredibly low still? Why? Because they want a discount. That's the catch. In return for offering you cash and providing you with the safety of not having this deal fall through with regard to financing-related issues, I want a little bit of a deal. Now, you might determine that it's worth it for you to give that buyer a little bit of a deal if they're paying cash. It depends on your situation and how motivated you are to sell your home. Again, you might have some things going on that dictate you need to sell this home. You can't afford to put your home under contract for the next 45 days and find out on day 44 that the buyer can't get financing and you've got to start this process all over again. And that's going to parlay into my last segment in this show. So stick around because we're going to talk about timing the process of selling your home and buying another and how you protect yourself. But that is the catch when it comes to a cash offer. Now, in our market, it being a very strong seller's market with limited inventory, the buyer might say or be of the mentality that, look, I'm going to offer cash and I'm going to offer the same that I would offer if I were getting a mortgage because I want that seller to take my offer. I understand the market and I understand the benefit to the seller and you're working with a buyer agent that knows how to sell that benefit to the seller. Now, is it a big risk to go with a financed buyer over a cash buyer? In some instances, yes. Again, it goes back to where that buyer is in that process of approval for financing. Are they pre-qualified? Are they pre-approved? Are they approved? Are they offering more on a house than they feel the market can bear or that comps can support? And is there going to be an issue with the appraisal? The appraisal and a mortgage are tied in with one another because the bank has to justify the amount that you're financing on that house. So classic example, if you buy a house for $500,000 and it appraises at four seventy-five, dollars the bank is only going to give you money up to four seventy-five. dollars And if that seller says, sorry, no, we're only going to sell it for $500,000 and you really want to buy it, then that means you have to come up with $25,000 in cash to bridge that gap. 
So again, when you're looking at an offer and it's cash versus financed, it's important to have an understanding of the, the difference between the two, but it's also important to look at all the other terms to the contract to determine whether that contract is actually going to close. It's one thing in this market to get your house under contract, but I'm finding that there's a good portion of homes that are going back on the market because they didn't appraise or because there were home inspection related issues or buyers couldn't get financed. And it's my job as a listing agent to look at the contract as a whole and say, okay, regardless of whether this is a cash offer or a financed offer, what is the likelihood of this getting to closing? Because once you put it under contract, that's when everything else in your life gets set into motion. Where are we going to move to next? And that's what I'm going to talk about in my final few minutes on this show, the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. So stick around. Again, if you have questions, give me a call, 843-345-1273. You're thinking about selling your house. You want to be able to time it perfectly in buying another. Go to my website, listingsincharleston.com. Submit your contact information, and we'll have a one-on-one conversation. Obviously, no cost, no obligation, just here to help. So stick around. This is the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. Have a real estate question? Ask Brian Beatty. Send him an email, lowcountryhomesales at gmail.com. The Brian Beatty Real Estate Show is on 1250 WTMA. WTMA. Expert news and views on the low country real estate scene. The Brian Beatty Real Estate Show on 1250 WTMA. Welcome back, Charleston, and thanks again for tuning in to the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on the Big Talker 1250 WTMA. As we wrap up our program, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, which is top of mind for anybody that's selling their house and then buying another, is how do we time this process? How do we make sure that if we're going to sell our house and go and buy another, that we're protected? Obviously, the biggest fear there is that you become homeless or you sell your house And there's a delay on the home that you're buying. What do you do? How do you protect yourself? How do you make sure that you're prepared? Well, I'll tell you a quick story. My wife and I sold our house and moved into another. And we we actually identified the house that we wanted to buy first. And we said, look, we are going to make you this offer on our house. And if you'll consider this offer, then we'll list our property for sale and we'll put it at a certain price we actually outlined the price reductions that we would agree to and the time in which we would reduce that price to show the seller that we are serious about buying their house and selling ours. But we put specific things in that contract to make sure that as the process moved forward with purchasing the property, that we were protected on the home that we were selling. So one of the things that we did on the home that we were selling is we had a contingency in the MLS that said that it was contingent upon us satisfying the contingencies of the home we were buying. Let me say that again, because that sounds a little complicated. We put a contingency on the home that we were selling that said that unless we are able to move forward with confidence in the home that we are buying, and we don't have to jump over any more hurdles, then we will sell our house. However, we need a certain amount of time to accomplish those goals so that we don't sell our house out from under us without having anywhere to move to. Our only interest, my wife and I, in purchasing that property was to move into that home. We had no interest in selling our house just to sell our house. We only wanted to buy that one specific house. So although our situation was a little different, and I understand that buyers typically aren't in a position where they can buy a home without selling theirs, we made sure that we were protected. So here's a little bit more on how that worked. We ended up closing on the house that we purchased before we sold ours. Ours was under contract. We understood that we were going to do some work to the house we were going to move into. So we lined up a corporate rental, a furnished rental for 45 days. That might be a legitimate option for you as a buyer if you know you're going to do some work to a house before you move into it. I mean, for us, we were it was a big deal. We were putting on a roof and new siding and changing some windows around. We ripped out all the floors. We had to put in new floors. We had to paint everything, new master bathroom. So we're doing a bunch of work to this house. It's not livable, especially for my wife and I with a 10-month-old daughter. That's just not going to work for us. So we had to find a place to stay in the interim. So we found a corporate rental. And if you're thinking about that route, which quite frankly has been very nice for us, uh, I'm kind of just looking at it as a 
six week vacation. <laughs> I mean, it's fully furnished. We stored our stuff. But if you're thinking about doing a corporate rental, you really should expect to pay about twice of what a typical rental uh, is going to cost because it's furnished. Everything is there cups, knives, baking ware, furniture, sheets, towels, everything. You just move in. It's like you're staying in a nice hotel for several weeks or several months, whatever the case might be. But that's one way of, of kind of transitioning from the home that you're selling into the home that you're buying is by doing a short-term rental or an extended stay hotel, whatever your comfort level is in, in living somewhere while you're about to move into the home you're buying. For some people, that's just not an option. Uh, you know, for us, we were able to make it work. Um, the, the condo that we're staying in is, is a mile and a half from the house that we're buying. So it actually works out well for us because we get to oversee the process of construction. We get to check in every day. Um, and it's right down the street from my office. So everything works out. But for those of you that want to sell your house and move into another and have a seamless transition, the day that you sell your house is the day that you buy your house. You really do have to be careful. You have to work with an agent that understands that process. And it's always been um, my experience that that really does take a conversation individually with that person to understand what their comfort level is for certain things. What's their budget? You know, if, you, if you're the type of person where you're going to have somebody pack up your house and move for you and you're not lifting a finger, then obviously that makes things a little bit easier. But again, we're working with all types of people, all types of price ranges, all types of areas. And if you're, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know, I'm going to need to pack this house up. I'm going to have to move it myself with my family and a few friends. And this has to be the domino effect. We have to sell our house and buy another same day. Well, let's, let's talk just a, a little bit more about how you can protect yourself. There's something called a leaseback agreement. I think this is an excellent way for you to protect yourself and not be caught in that position where you sell your home in the morning and then there's a delay on the home that you're buying and sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's two days, sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's a month. What do you do? You have your stuff in a moving truck. You were expecting to move into your new house that afternoon. One way of adding a little safety net is by agreeing to close on your home and then for a week or whatever the amount of time is comfortable for you, you are allowed to stay in your home, you rent it back from the new buyer, and that gives you time to pack up your house and move seamlessly into the new one. It allows you time to close and have a few days. It's, it's always stressful when you do that back-to-back closing effect and it doesn't work out. There's a ton of stuff that you can put in contracts to protect yourself, and I'd love to have conversations with you about those specific items So give me a call, 843-345-1273, or go to my website, listingsincharleston.com, and we'll have that conversation. But again, putting a leaseback agreement in place is a really good idea. Having a contingency to the contract for the home that you're selling that says that you have a specific amount of time to agree to the sale. You know, whenever a buyer makes an offer on a property, they've got basically two weeks built in to do their home inspection and their termite inspection and inspect your, uh, you know, or, or look at the insurance and, and just make sure that they're crossing their T's and dotting their I's. It's called a due diligence period. Why not have the same thing on the seller side? Why not say, look, I need you to give me two weeks to determine whether or not the house that I'm going to buy is actually going to work out or not. And if we know that we're moving forward with confidence in the house that we're buying, that we're under contract for, then we'll sell you the house and we'll move forward with that process. But everything has to tie into it to, to one another. I think that you're probably gaining the sense and listening to me talk about all of this that it's very complicated. It doesn't have to be if you lay out a plan. And that's what I do with people to help them understand and be reassured that we are not going to make them homeless. We are going to make sure that we have protection in place so that you don't get caught with your stuff in a moving truck closing on a Friday and, and it gets pushed to Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. So again, if there are specific questions that I can answer, you're thinking about going through that process and you want to know, start to finish, how that works. What sort of protection we can put in place contractually to make sure that you don't end up homeless, which unfortunately has happened to some people and they have to then figure it out. They've got to go store their stuff. They've got to go get a hotel. Uh, It's Again, it's a very stressful process. 
but it doesn't have to be if you think things through and you come up with a game plan and you work toward executing that game plan. So that's all it for me. I'm out of time. If you'd like to reach out to me personally, again, 843-345-1273 or go to my website, listingsincharleston.com. This is the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Join us for another edition of the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show next Saturday morning from 8 till 9. Contact Brian Beatty online at listingsincharleston.com.